<clears throat> the achievement gap for me is we have a population of people in the United States who are not able to have the same resources. The students that come from lower social economic classes are already set up in the K through 12 system. Oftentimes they're going to poorer schools that are have a lot less funding. The class sizes are larger. At home, they might not have access to books. So it's like the, the system starts very early on in the kindergarten. The education achievement is could be actually forecasted in a good way, depending on the family income. And your SAT scores is very much correlated with the family income. We have, we have really uh, not found a way to get low-income students uh, in a meaningful way engaged in higher education. The achievement gap really has been largely focused on in the K-12 system. That it's the gap that's been studied and can statistically been, be shown as this disparity between groups of kids on educational performance. The gap starts at the pre-kindergarten and unless we try to fix it at that level, that gap could continue throughout. The process of establishing an education system began in the 1600s and is continually being revised. After President Thomas Jefferson proposed the idea of the public education system, conflicting opinions about the necessity of a public system and the role religion should play led to a period of only localized schooling. In 1852, Massachusetts passed the first laws mandating an elementary education for all children and by 1918, these laws were enforced in every state. As the elementary school system grew, so did the need for a secondary system. The compulsory elementary education laws stimulated growth of secondary education in the United States. Uh, so the reason is try to uh, attack this problem at the kindergarten and then you know, try to diminish the gap from there. So the level of preparedness is not the same. Running on a very old system, uh, um, that I think we could use a little bit of a revolution maybe in the way we look at higher education, the way we look at our education system. I think right now we're trying to fix tiny little aspects like how much emphasis do we put on the ACT score versus GPA versus something else. And yet what we probably need is a whole new system. Wow, reform in K through 12, that's, that's a big one. Um, I think it'll be a huge help. I do think that's a big one. Um, we see students coming into college and honestly it all depends on sometimes where they even started pre-k, you know. Um, I think reform will be slow to happen, but I think if schools um, focus more on the student and also uh, understanding that some students may not go to college and it may just be a thing that they don't want to do. In the United States today, one child out of seven uh, go to bed hungry and um, they don't have enough, enough food. Forget about balanced food. So um, your brain growth is very important as a kid and therefore uh, try to provide that at the, at the kindergarten and so that they have, they have you know, a, a well-developed brain. And also, uh, in, in class, in order to focus on your, on your schooling, uh, you should not be hungry. The fact that even in the K through 12 system, um, students are not afforded the same resources. Districts don't have the same resources. And so the, the learning that takes place, the type of learning, the type of teaching that occurs, the type of research, um, all those things are not necessarily equal. And so it, it really lacks an equity lens or an equity perspective. The best predictor of your school achievement, your, your, your uh, reading or math in your SAT, the best predictor 
is not you know the quality of the professor is not the you know, how many hours you studied and so on it is a family income so socioeconomic status kind of indirectly translates into a, a, a less rigorous or less complete high school curriculum. Pierre Bordeaux talks about the cultural capital that is developed in certain classes. That some kids, simply by learning the right silverware to use at the table, um, who are the main artists in our history of art, who, where, where you're supposed to sit, how you're supposed to stand when someone enters the room, that these sort of social cues are so ingrained in kids of certain cultural classes that they already start out ahead of many kids that don't have that experience. Um, somewhere that I could pay and potentially not have to take out loans. Basically 90%, 95% of my family didn't go to college. When looking for a college, I couldn't just look for the one I wanted to go to, I had to look for one that my family and I could afford. It's not that there's something not virtuous about people who have low incomes, it's just that what often happens is that po places where there's concentrated poverty, there tend to be schools that aren't well funded. And it's not just like the inner city thing, it's also true um, here in Colorado, a lot of small, uh, small rural communities uh, have a lot of low-income students, and they also are so isolated and so poor in their funding because they have small populations. Even the level of nutrition, uh, it matters how your brain develops during during the infancy period or the childhood. Today, more than 85,530 traditional public schools exist in the United States. According to Education Commission of the States, there are a variety of factors that appear related to the achievement gap students' racial and or economic background, their parents' education level, their access to high-quality preschool instruction, school funding, peer influences, teachers' expectations, and curricular and instructional quality. At the University of Northern Colorado, 36% of the student population is made up of first-generation students. As, as the income goes down, the, the percentage of people participating in higher education goes down. And, um, and that hasn't, if, and, and if you look at that last, look at the, the top line of the top income quartile, see how the trend line goes up, 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 basically. I mean, it goes up and down, but the basic trend line is up. Look at the bottom income quartile and the, and the third income quartile. They're flat, right? So over time, uh, we, have, we have really uh, not found a way to get low income students uh, in a meaningful way engaged in higher education. So that's a piece, that's a piece of the gap there. By the time they hit high school, they're tracked into, um, oftentimes these students are tracked into the lower achieving classes, the expectations are lower, and we also know that, that people in general, humans will often rise to expectations. And so if the expectations are lower, then the educational outcomes are lower. And therefore, by the time they finally get to college, you've got this huge gap. Um. Our high schools are not always doing a great job of keeping expectations real high. And then they come into college and they flounder. But the biggest areas I see floundering is not in academic skills. I see it in organization, keeping on task for deadlines, getting work in. A lot of that is where the, the achievement gap is playing a role. Originally, again, the advanced degrees were for professionals. They were really geared towards those in the higher classes. That's what the system was set up for. Um, as someone who came from a low SES family, I think that um, they just don't know how to maneuver the things around here. Usually if they come from a low SES family, um, they may have had one family member graduate from college or maybe none at all. There's a really low likelihood that they've experienced this before and same with their parents. So um, coming into it, it can be very overwhelming. You have financial aid, but if no one's ever taught you what financial aid is or what a loan looks like um, or what interest rate is, you know, that can be really scary to navigate. The achievement gap, I think, is, um, 
is the result of the fact that we have in the last 20 years seen a, a real change in the student who is coming into higher education. Um, there was a time when, say in the 70s, when the majority of college students, the vast majority of college students were white and male, uh, tended to come from the upper couple of uh, income quartiles. It was a middle class undertaking and so on. Um, you have to help your family. Now there is a lot of pressure on you uh, than, than a kid from a higher socioeconomic group. Uh, as a kid from so higher socioeconomic group, uh, you do things for your own and so on, and you are not responsible for your brothers and sisters and parents and so on. But that, that pressure could be there. Typically, when I am working with a student that maybe comes from a, 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 a low socioeconomic status, um, their thought of, uh, of, of money is much different than students who are um, a higher middle, middle income to the highest uh, uh, socioeconomic status. So um, there's a, there, I think there's a mindset that's already established in families of being very mindful. Let's say students having a huge problem in a class and the class isn't working for them. They can call their parents and say, what do I do? And their parents can tell them, well, you can probably withdraw from the class. Go talk to the administration about what's the process for withdrawing from a class. A student that doesn't have family members that went to college might feel insecure about asking those kinds of questions. Who are they gonna ask that question to? Their friends, I'm failing this class, what do I do? Maybe they will, but, but maybe they'll get wrong information then if they're going to their peers, especially if their peers also come from you know, a, a background where they don't have those kinds of resources and know-how. So what happens is that shows up early on that very first year is where the access to resources is most important and where if the wrong questions are being asked or the student doesn't know what questions to ask in the first place, doesn't know how to get to the resources, then, um, then they can have problems in the very first semester, in the second semester. Working during college, I think, is really important because um, you, like, a lot of people actually go out, like, have dinners and stuff, or, like, even um, paying for books. So I think it's really important to have money in the bank. Um, I definitely think it's tough um, to find that balance between classes and work and um, studying and doing homework. Up. I can't say whether that's like good or bad for people, but I think it's um, necessary a lot of times to pay for college. And on top of that, I think it gives you experience just in the workforce. I knew that I had worked from this time to this time, and I only had this many hours to do this homework that was due, so it really made me more disciplined. Um, and I did better in school, I think, because of that like time that I had to set aside specifically for working. Um, I do think that it depends on how much work you're doing though. So I think what we see in community colleges, especially when I worked in there, we saw students that were working, you know, 40 or 50 hours a week and trying to be a full-time student, which I think then that's the extreme side where it starts to impede your academic ability, right? Um, and so I think there's this fine line that you have to kind of walk if you're a student that does need to work in school and also needs to be full-time. Um, I think it can be beneficial but I can also see it impeding people and actually being detrimental to their academic success. I think college is, is vital. I would say college is vital to living a successful life. By that, do I mean a life where you can make a lot of money? Uh, uh, partly, uh, because it is true that I mean, there, there was a big thing, uh, was it Marco Rubio uh, in, the, in the Republican debate recently said, you know, there's, the market for philosophers is not very big. If you want to make money, become a welder. Because for wel you know, welders can make 35 bucks an hour right out of the, right out of the chute. And, and that's true in the short term. Um, you know, you can come out, of, you can be 18 years old, go through a welding training program and come out and make a lot of money but then project that 30 years ahead. If you project it 30 years ahead over a lifetime, someone with a college degree, almost without exception, is going to earn more money over the long haul. And, and it's not just about earning money, it's about um, being a citizen. It's about um, 
it's about about ideas and beauty and experiencing the things that uh, and developing an appetite for those things early on. I mean, so for me, college gave me a life. Uh, I wouldn't have a life without higher education. I believe that for an educated democracy, we need our citizens. This is a very classic position, a very Dewey position, a very Thomas Jefferson position. Um, that we need our our citizenry needs to be educated in kind of this liberal arts tradition. In other words, you need to understand historical context. You need to understand how the American government functions. You guys, you are in a much better starting point than where I was at your position. And uh, so education is, is the core of uh, not only having a higher income, but being uh, um, an informed citizen in, you know, on the issues and uh, leading a healthy life. Since public education began in the early 1900s, a lot has changed. What was once a world of one-room schoolhouses and chalkboards is now a world full of schools filled with thousands of students and higher technology. Higher ed is beginning to pay more attention to the fact that if we're going to grow, we're not going to grow by everybody fighting over the 80% of the upper income students who, who are going to come to college anyway. If we're going to grow, as universities and keep our enrollments robust and serve society, we need to figure out strategies for recruiting, targeting recruiting uh, Hispanic and African American students. And, and I think most universities, certainly UNC, uh, does reach out in a very targeted way to Hispanic students uh, and, and tries to supply a support network for Hispanic students and for African American students. Um, but I believe that it is a matter of a deficit thinking. Um, I grew up in a very poor household. Um, I was also destined as a Latino male to not go to college, um, perhaps graduate from, college, uh, from uh, high school. Um, so the statistics said one thing, but my Motivation, my my non-deficit thinking, if you will, um, allowed me to get to where I am today. Heavily regulated standards and testing was first introduced by the Reagan administration in 1983. The push for a more regulated public school system gained momentum in 1994 when President Clinton signed into law Goals 2000, which provided grants to help states develop academic standards. One of the most well-known pieces of legislation passed to attack the education gap is No Child Left Behind, signed into law by President George W. Bush in 2002. The act was supposed to decrease the level of competition in schools, giving each child a desire to an equal education and an equal opportunity for achievement. Even though the effectiveness of the act was highly disputed, it has made steps in the right direction. In 2014, No Child Left Behind declared every child in America as proficient. It held schools accountable for minority students such as special education, English language learners, and students who come from poorer communities. The rate of high school graduates who immediately enrolled into two-year or four-year universities went from 29% in 1980 to 69% in 2008. Historically, this immediate enrollment was higher for white high school graduates than any other minority students. Although that is still true today, the percentage of black and Hispanic students enrolling into universities has been steadily increasing since the 1980s. Over time, starting in 1980 and moving up to 2008, um, the annual per, uh, percentage of high school students who enroll in two and four year colleges has been creeping upward. You can see that uh, black, black students the, the percentage has increased about 13 and Hispanic students has gone from 52 to 63, about 11 or 12 uh, percent. You know, some of the, the presidential candidates are talking about um, free tuition. Um, and um, I, I, I can't imagine how to do that. I can imagine what that would look like. Meaning, if there was that opportunity 
like what other countries do, if other countries can do it, the United States can. But UNC, the thing about UNC that differentiates us from the other, from the CSUs and the CUs, is that we have a history and a proud history of finding students who have potential that doesn't show up in their test scores, may not show up in their GPAs, but it shows up and coaching it out, coaching them up and, and finding their strengths at an individual level and coaching them up. <laughs> Look at me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, my parents are in one of the most uh, poor countries in the world and farmers and don't know how to read and write and look where I am so you don't even have to just my life is an example of what education is and uh, with education uh, you can pretty much set a goal and attain it education can make a life much different than maybe being uh, in the cycle of oppression the cycle of oppression, um, the, the, those cycles, I think, have to be broken. It gives you power to be able to take critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, the ability to seek out and understand different perspectives from your own, the ability to think and transmit your thoughts onto paper with good writing, the ability to calculate problems mathematically or solve problems scientifically. All of that translates into many different jobs. The more people that are educated on um, the, the connections and the issues and all of this, the, the stronger our country can be. So that there shouldn't be a difference. As long as the student is putting in the effort, the work, um, attending the supplemental instructions, going to tutoring, things like, of that nature, um, there should be some more equity in terms of what, what those classroom results uh, look like. The strategy is then to look at that and say, what are we doing to provide equity? Because we know not all people start off in the same place. We need to pay attention so that we, in, in our recruiting of administrators and our recruiting of faculty, that we are aware that, that there's a, a real need in our university for, um, for that kind of, uh, of mentoring relationship. Education is probably the most important thing in order to tackle this problem. Every student deserves an equal opportunity to a successful life and career. A student's socioeconomic status should not determine whether or not that child will succeed. And I think taking the message, like once they figure out how are we doing our admissions, who gets to go to college? Which becomes the big question, right? So who gets to go to college? So here's the thing. For every one year of schooling in the United States, your wage increases by 10 percent. So what that translates to is a liberal arts education not only helps equip you for choice in your future, and that's why I think it's benefit, but it's even beyond that. It equips you to be a good citizen. Spreading awareness of academic disparities is the first step in creating equal opportunity for students of all socioeconomic backgrounds and narrowing the achievement gap. We are a better society today than we were 50, 60 years ago. And there it is, the achievement gap.